Ngā mihi nui kia koutou kato tonight on Prime News. An historic first as Kiwi's Mark Matariki, uh, Matariki Day with an official public holiday celebrated right across Aotearoa. A 41-year-old man is granted name suppression following a stabbing attack on Auckland's North Shore. And how a quick-thinking swim coach saved the life of, of an artistic swimmer who lost consciousness while still in the water. This is Prime News, first at 5.30. Kia ora, good evening and manawa tia a Matariki. Today marks our very first official public holiday to celebrate Matariki, which signifies the Māori New Year. Events kicked off with a special dawn ceremony at Te Papa in the capital. There, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern told crowds, this is our moment in time to come together as one nation. Leighton Haeckel was there. The dawn of a new day. A new year for not only Māori, but us all. Heralded by the rising of this special and significant cluster of stars, Ngā Mata o Tiariki o Tāwhiri Mātia, or Matariki for short. The ceremony called a hotapu took place on the balcony at Te Papa. It signifies the start of the Māori New Year as the smoke from the kai or food rises to feed the Matariki cluster. And it was led by renowned expert in Māori tikanga, Sir Pau Temera, who says there are three key messages. Matariki Hunganui, remembering those we have lost in the past year. Matariki Ahunganui, celebrating the present with food and whānau, and Matariki Manako Nui. It is a moment to look to the future and dream about a brighter tomorrow for all of us who call this country home. And it's been a moment years in the making. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern first campaigned on the idea at the last election. This is now an official holiday that does not divide us by Māori ancestry or other. Rather, it unites us under the stars of Aotearoa. This is about uh, who we are moving forward as a nation. So this is legacy building, but for all of us. But it was a long road to get here. An advisory group was set up to ensure the holiday stuck to Kopapa Māori or the Māori approach. Head of that group was Indigenous expert and astronomer Professor Rangi Mātāmua. I'm elated. I never ever thought that I would be standing in this position and people around the country have just taken it on with such zeal because of the principles and the values that underpin this holiday. This morning's ceremony was broadcast right around the country on many different platforms. A first and a clear display of the Matariki message. The stars of Matariki are slightly different in their position, size, brightness and what they represent. Yet, regardless of their individual characteristics and purpose, this morning they rose together as one cluster, as one family. This is the message of Matariki to all of us. Events are happening around the Motu or country promoting togetherness. I believe that this is the first reintroduced indigenous holiday anywhere in the world. Today, a turning point for not only us here in Aotearoa, but everyone across the globe. And reporter Leighton Haeckel is on Wellington's waterfront tonight. Leighton, are the celebrations continuing? They sure are, Michael. There are thousands of people down here on the waterfront. There is so much to do and see. There is a, a fire and lights festival, as you can probably tell, behind me. Uh, there are food trucks. People are just really enjoying each other's company and having a good night. There are more expected as well, with the fire, uh, fireworks kicking off at just after seven, although it has been a bit of a controversy. Some Māori leaders uh, advised against the fireworks, saying it wasn't quite suitable to celebrate Matariki. Uh, but despite the controversy, the council went ahead with it, and it certainly has brought a lot of people out and about in Wellington tonight and it's a great way to round off our first public Matariki holiday ever. It certainly is. Leighton, tēnā And Matariki celebrations were of course held right across the country. In the South Island, a po was unveiled and trees planted to celebrate the opening of Takapuneke Reserve in Akaroa. 
While in the North Island, under a campfire on Great Barrier Island, descendants of Kawa Marae marked the occasion with a ceremony giving offering to the Fetu of Matariki. And back on land in Auckland, many spent the day with friends and family. Just all here at the park um, celebrating together in um, native grounds. Celebrate it with all our whānau. We've had an awesome day and so nice that we can be able to celebrate and recognise what's all the history behind it. A man has appeared in court charged in connection with the stabbing that left four people injured on Auckland's North Shore. As Adam Hollingworth reports, police have today repeated assurances that it was an isolated incident. 24 hours after a stabbing spree sent two beautiful North Shore beaches into lockdown, plenty were back at play. There's always lots of people walking along the beach and, you know, we just don't see anything here. So, you know, it just seems like it was quite a random act that, um, you know, just wrong place at the wrong time. We knew that the, it was going to be safe down here today. You, norm like, yeah. you normally walk along here? Yeah, we walk yeah. along here a lot so and have done for years. So it was a bit close to home. We decided not to walk yesterday, so yeah, yeah. we were thankful we did. Yeah. But others voiced concerns that the tranquility of the usually quiet suburbs has been erased. This is one of the nicest areas to live in Auckland. Everybody looks out for one another. There's never a problem here. It's sad to see people getting pressure on them like this, causing this sort of thing. We've spoken to the family of one of the victims on this street who say they're being comforted by friends who've been visiting her this morning, but she doesn't want to talk about her ordeal just yet. The family of another woman who was stabbed told News Hub she was OK and had given a statement to police. Four people were injured in the attack before members of the public intervened at Mairangi Bay. The man whose crutch was used told News Hub five or six people ended up following the assailant. One of them asked to borrow the crutch before he and another man with a stick simultaneously hit the attacker in the leg and head, breaking the crutch and knocking him out. The attacker was taken to hospital and placed under police guard. A 41-year-old Murray's Bay man has appeared in court charged with four counts of wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm and one count of assault using a knife as a weapon. He'll next appear in court in three weeks. Police say they've maintained an increased presence in the area as the investigation continues. Adam Hollingworth, Prime News. It's estimated around 270,000 people are in desperate need of emergency, emergency shelter and food aid following the 6.1 magnitude earthquake which struck Afghanistan. More than 1,000 people were killed and entire villages were completely destroyed, forcing many families to now live in makeshift tents. CBS's Charlie Degatta has the latest. An orderly line of men prepare a row of graves for the victims of the earthquake. A stark contrast compared to one day earlier when rescuers were forced to dig with their bare hands in a desperate search for survivors. A lack of roads to the remote area meant shuttling the injured away by helicopter. At least 1,500 people have been injured, many left fighting for their lives. There was a rumbling and the bed began to shake, Shabir says. I'm sure seven or nine people from my family who were in the same room as me are dead. The earthquake struck one of the poorest regions of one of the poorest countries on the planet. Decades of conflict, government corruption and now crippling sanctions have brought Afghanistan to its knees and left the Taliban begging the international community for help. Many aid groups fled the country after last year's Taliban takeover. It's in a country that's already on the brink. We know that it's a uh, it, food security situation is where we're talking about we're close to a famine-like situation. People are really already hanging on by, by a threat. As the death toll climbs, even for thousands of survivors now made homeless and facing widespread hunger, the suffering has only begun. The World Health Organization is deciding whether to put monkeypox on its highest level of alert. An emergency committee has convened to discuss, to discuss whether to declare the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. Lucy Warhurst explains. This is one of the world's largest music festivals, Glastonbury in England. It hasn't been seen in three years due to COVID. But as the festival gets underway, the risk of another virus circulating is causing concern. 
monkeypox. Now the WHO is considering whether it's an international public health emergency. It's slowly spreading, but it is spreading and, the, and it, it's quite rightly that the WHO is concerned that it needs to be contained. It's now spread to 42 countries. The UK has the most cases, followed by Spain, Germany, Portugal and Canada. Australia has at least seven confirmed cases. So far, none have arrived in New Zealand. Labelling monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern would give it the same designation as the COVID-19 pandemic. Canterbury University epidemiologist Arundam Basu says it's nowhere near as transmissible. It's going to be much more self-contained. A few people will be infected. The spread will not be as wide at all. Monkeypox is spread through close contact. So far, the outbreak has primarily affected gay and bisexual men, but anyone can get it. It's not who you are, it's what you do that makes you at risk. Populations have become more susceptible to monkeypox as a result of the termination of routine smallpox vaccinations, which offered some cross-protection in the past. But Arundam Basu says there's no need to be overly worried. So we have to be watchful of it, but um, there is absolutely no need to press the panic button at all. He says New Zealand is well positioned to control it if and when it arrives here. Lucy Warhurst, Prime News. The first official joint portrait of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge has been unveiled at a museum in England. The painting by artist Jamie Corrath was viewed by the royal couple during a trip to Cambridge where it is on show to the public at the Fitzwilliam Museum. Corrath said he wanted to show William and Kate in a way where they appeared both relaxed and approachable as well as elegant and dignified. Kia mo tonu mai e hari ake nei e ngā rongo a taumata. Accusations Donald Trump pressured the US Justice Department to overturn the 2020 election result. And the cafe where everyone is welcome, including off-leash dogs. A former US Justice Department official says former President Donald Trump pressured the agency to overturn the 2020 election result. It comes as new documentary footage shows Trump's eldest daughter and former adviser Ivanka initially supporting her father's election fraud claims. Zane Small has the details. January 6, 2021. The day a mob of Donald Trump supporters attacked the Capitol in Washington, D.C., seeking to overturn his presidential election defeat. In the latest development from the U.S. committee investigating the attack, a former Justice Department official has rubbished Trump's allegations of voter fraud. We had concluded, based on actual investigations, actual witness interviews, actual reviews of documents, that these allegations simply had no merit. He says Donald Trump gave this order. Say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. The former president isn't the only Trump in hot water. In new documentary footage, daughter and former White House adviser Ivanka Trump appears to support her father's voter fraud claims. Every single vote needs to be counted and needs to be heard, and he campaigned for the voiceless. And I think a lot of Americans feel very, very disenfranchised right now um, and really question the sanctity of our elections. Fast forward to earlier this month, she had a very different perspective. That's when she told the committee she accepted the Attorney General's conclusion that there was no widespread voter fraud. It affected my perspective. Um, I respect Attorney General Barr. Um, so I accepted what he said, was saying. Alex Holder's new documentary has 120 hours of never-before-seen footage of the Trumps, of the days leading up to and after the events of January 6th. Are there revelations from your interviews with Donald Trump that will shock people? I believe so, yes. The yet-to-be-released docu-series has been subpoenaed by the January 6th investigation committee. Trump could still face criminal charges for his actions, with new evidence mounting every day. Zane Small, Prime News. Myanmar's deposed leader Aung San Suu Kyi has been moved from house arrest to solitary confinement in prison. The Nobel Peace Prize recipient was arrested when the military overthrew her government in February 2021. 
Ms Suchi denies the host of charges against her, which have been widely condemned as politically motivated. The military government says the move is in accordance with criminal laws in Myanmar. Well, a quick-thinking coach has saved the life of a competitor at the Swimming World Champs in Budapest. Anita Alvarez had just completed her solo artistic swimming final when she lost consciousness and sank to the bottom of the pool. Her coach, Andrea Fuentes, quickly dived into the water and pulled the swimmer to the surface, where she received medical attention. Fuentes revealed Alvarez went two minutes without breathing. What you want to do when you finish is like really breathe. And instead of going up, she was going down. And at the beginning, I was like, maybe she just wants to rest and like, you know, like don't do any effort. But then I was like, no, that's not normal. Alvarez has since recovered, but is yet to decide whether to take part in the team event. It's not the first time Alvarez has fainted while competing, having previously passed out at an Olympic qualifying event in Barcelona last year. Well, the appetite for frogs' legs amongst French and Belgians is driving some species to the brink of extinction. Europe imports as many as 200 million wild frogs every year from Turkey and Indonesia, contributing to a serious depletion of native species. Scientists warn the Anatolian water frog could be extinct in Turkey by 2032. They say frogs play a central role in the ecosystem as insect killers. And when frogs disappear, the use of pesticides will increase. A cafe in New York has literally gone to the dogs, operating as an off-leash dog cafe. The owners of Black Lab Cafe saw an opportunity for people to enjoy dining together with their pooches, saying they're not fans of having dogs tied up outside. Given the furry friends are off-leash, they're able to interact with mates, but a full glass wall separates them from the food to comply with health and hygiene laws. O kia mau tonu mai e hariaki nei i ngā rongo a taumata. We have your weather and in sport the dismissal that has to be seen to be believed in the third cricket test between the Black Caps and England. Turn it up with a new Suzuki Ignis and prime new sport. The Kiwis put the finishing touches to their preparations this morning ahead of their long-awaited international return against Matema Atonga tomorrow night. Mount Smart is officially a sellout for the game, with a sea of Tongan red expected in Auckland. Kiwis veteran Kieran Foran's expecting a massive occasion as rugby league finally makes its big return to the stadium. We, um, yeah, as they say, a sea of red, I, I would dare say, but um, it'll be a great atmosphere, something we're all looking forward to. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I think it'll be a, a really special occasion. Kickoff tomorrow is 20 past five, while their female counterparts, the Kiwi Ferns, face Tonga at 10 past three. Well, England's cricketers will be sick of the sight of Daryl Mitchell and Tom Blundell by the end of the Test Series with the Black Caps. For the third straight match, the informed pair rescued the Black Caps with a partnership of over 100 runs. Luke Robinson wraps up the opening day's action from Headingley. It was the worst possible start for the Black Caps. Brilliant from Bro set the tone. Tom Latham out for a Such duck a in the first the over. Will down. Young following soon after. Oh, yeah, what a start. The visitors' day got even worse when skipper Kane Williamson yeah. fell for 31. Yeah, Williamson is not waiting. Before one of the most bizarre dismissals yeah, you'll ever see. The chance he's gone. How's it got there? How has it got there? Henry Nichols there? shot ricocheting off Daryl Mitchell's bat into the hands of Alex Lees. Oh. The Black Caps 123 for 5 and teetering. They look to their informed duo to salvage the innings. Mitchell and Tom Blundell are the only two Black Caps to have scored over 150 runs so far this series. That sweep and hard along the ground for four. They needed to fire once again and they did. Lovely. Mitchell going past 50 for the fourth time in five innings. And does so in fine style to bring up another half century. As the pair put on an unbeaten 102 run partnership to get the Black Caps to 225 for five at stumps. And it's been Groundhog Day. England excellent, England dominant and then those two, Blundell and Mitchell come together. Mitchell eyeing a third straight test hundred on day two at Headingley. Luke Robinson, Prime News. Roger Tuivasa Sheik is still adapting to the 15 man code, just one week out from the All Blacks clash against Ireland. The former Warriors captain has completed his first ever ABs camp as the team wrapped up in Northland today. 
Tuivasa Sheik admits although he's learnt a lot over the week, there are still some aspects of the game he needs to work on before next Saturday night. Just trying to understand the breakdowns and trying to tackle these um, 120, 140 kg props. So that's probably been the, the toughest, is understanding the defensive systems and, and the breakdown. The two teams last met in Dublin last year where the Kiwis were defeated 29 to 20. Ryan Fox has continued his red-hot form on the European Golf Tour, firing an opening round six under par 66 to be firmly in contention in Germany. Fox carded three birdies in his final five holes of the day to finish in a share of fourth, four shots back from leader Hao Tong Lee. Winning earlier in the year took the pressure off and I can just go and freewheel it and kind of play like I don't care. Obviously I do care, but um, you know, there's, there doesn't feel like there is much, there's as much pressure on, on the golf course as maybe what there was the last couple of years. Meanwhile, Lydia Ko carded an even pass 72 in the first round of the Women's PGA Championship in Washington. South Korea's Inji Chun leads the field after posting a record equaling eight under par. Former New Zealand Breakers star Osmang Deng has been drafted into the NBA, picked up by the Oklahoma City Thunder. The French Ford was selected 11th by the New York Knicks before being immediately traded to the Thunder. Deng follows in the footsteps of former breaker RJ Hampton, who was drafted by the Orlando Magic in 2020. And the Magic had the first pick today, selecting Paolo Banchero from Duke University. Well, time now for a look at the weather. A trough with embedded fronts spread across the country is bringing with it cloud and rain for much of Aotearoa tomorrow. There's a chance of thunderstorms and hail for Auckland, but it will at least be fairly warm with temperatures between 17 and 18 degrees. Morning rain should clear for Tauranga and the Hawke's Bay, leaving a partly cloudy rest of the day. And it's the same for the other side of the island, except for some possible thunderstorms and hail in New Plymouth in the afternoon. The capital can expect some rain with their breakfast tomorrow and then some showers to linger in the afternoon. Some possible heavy falls before dawn on the west coast of the South Island with a chance of a thunderstorm in Westport. But it's mainly fine on the other side of the Alps with Kaikoura and Christchurch set to hit 17 degrees. And in the deep south it'll be a chilly start for those places inland with a spattering of showers elsewhere as winds turn southerly in the afternoon. Thunderstorms in Samoa are the only blip in an otherwise fine day for our neighbours all over the Pacific Ocean. And that is us for this Friday the 24th of June. I'm Michael O'Keefe. Till next time, mā te wā, pō mārie, good night and mānau atea a matariki.